Um, here's the panel that you've been waiting for after we had it hinted in every other panel so far and the lots of questions and lots of quick solutions being thrown around. Um, like the last session, for example, when will voice recognition be the norm? Just easy, take people's eyes out, take their arms off, and they have to use voice <laughs> recognition. <laughs> a lot of things that we actually think is coming had to be used in accessibility for years and years already. I always see accessibility as a hardcore usability testing. It's something that people need and not something that we just want to have. But Derek's going to do a better job in that. My job is right now not to talk, but to introduce people. So uh, to first make fun of the Germans that have a family name like Luthwaite, Sarah is here. Uh, she's from King's College and she's an academic researcher and writer bridging the gap between critical disability theory and accessibility practice, something that was on our mind for a long, long time and we've been discussing a lot in between us, hopefully. Andrew Ronsley over here is from the RNIB and he's an accessibility and usability specialist focused on the web and mobile platforms. He's also contributed to the surf rights standards, which was an interesting thing to look at. Alice Boxhall is from Google, but she knows about accessibility. And <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was unfair, but it was so good because everybody, everybody else I talked to, she's like, and here's Alice. She's going to talk to you later about accessibility, so no pressure. You have to answer all the questions right now. Uh, she works on the accessibility developer tools, extension and library, and that's something like we used in the past. We had uh, performance tools for developer tools, but now we have accessibility testers in there as well, which are great and absolutely necessary for things like a Chromebook where you only have Chrome on it and nothing else. And Matthew Tiley Atkinson from the Pacciello Group over there is a... Um, is from the Pacciello Group, a tester, screen magnifier and occasional text-to-speech user. And he works on web accessibility, accessible gaming, which is an interesting topic, especially when you think about these kind of Kinect things. Um, level editing and supporting older users. Older users, is that a political correct term? I'm not sure. Uh, so speaking of people that have been around for a longer time, uh, I'm going to introduce you now to Derek Featherstone, <laughs> who has been with me in the accessibility world for a long, long time and worked on the first book that we both had chapters in the web accessibility book that two or four people read and uh, followed up later on. So without further ado, I'll over to Derek. So I'm here today to talk about accessibility and most people think of accessibility in very uh, technical terms. and, and the number one point that I want everybody to walk away from this today with is that accessibility is all about people. It has to be about people because if it's not about people, we end up doing the wrong thing even though we're meaning to do the right thing. Uh, so all of us that are up here have a background in doing this stuff for people. So Christian actually started uh, his first foray into understanding accessibility was when he was working with people with disabilities when he worked for the Red Cross. Sarah is a researcher. She, she actually works with real people uh, on, on accessibility issues. Uh, Alice is putting ARIA support into Chrome, and that's for people to use, right? We, we cannot forget this. Uh, Andrew actually works with people taking smartphones to them to show them and demonstrate all the different accessibility features of smartphones and how those things can actually have an impact on their day-to-day -day life. Um, and, and Matthew started changing the authoring environment for gaming so that that could be, uh, so that that could be accessible to people that were blind. The, and oh, and I, do, I do too. I work with people with accessibility, with disabilities every day. We do research and testing and try to figure out what, what UX is for people with disabilities, right? What does UX mean to them? And so hearing all of the things that everybody's talking about this morning uh, and this afternoon has been absolutely fascinating because we're talking about it at very technical levels, but at the end of the day, people have to use those tools. And that, to me, is what, what accessibility is all about. Um, we, we tend to simplify things, and you probably have heard of, of all of these different uh, conditions or things that people have, uh, that, that you know, people are blind or they have low vision, they have hearing difficulties, 
or that they have a, a mobility or a dexterity impairment. Uh, and, and when you start to think of all of these things, even, even those things seem to be very physical, but what about the cognitive side of things? And that, those are traditionally the things that we're thinking about when we think about accessibility. But there's a whole other realm that we need to start to get, get into and explore. Um, how many of you have heard of things like vestibular disorders? So there, there's a whole group of people that, that have some kind of vestibular uh, disorder, and, and I don't even like the word disorder, but issues with their balance. And so when they're looking at a screen with all you know, your fancy CSS animations and your parallax effects, that actually makes them nauseous, right? It actually causes migraines. So when we have, you know, when you're scrolling down a page and you have a, a car that you've animated with CSS that's going like this across the page, that actually makes somebody nauseous, right? These are, these are new things that aren't sort of in mainstream accessibility. Uh, and, and we need to start to take those things into account. Um, things like uh, speech, we, the, the very last panel was talking about, well, what about, what about speech? And, and as Christian pointed out, voice recognition software was originally invented for people with disabilities. So on the speech side of things, and this is, this is a, a, I think, a, an absolutely critical thing for us to keep in mind as we move forward, speech is just one modality, right? It, what happens if we create interfaces that use that as the only modality? And what does that do for somebody that speaks a different language, that, that has a stutter, uh, that uh, maybe has cerebral palsy and has difficulty speaking? Right? We need to create interfaces that are entirely flexible. And, and one of the other, uh, other panels earlier, the pointers, what about custom gestures? Well, what about uh, the fact that, and, and so here's a custom gesture, move up and to the left. Well, that custom gesture is already be, being used on Android for screen reader users that are using the TalkBack screen reader on Android. So what happens when that custom gesture that you've created and built into your page conflicts with the custom gesture that is required for the screen reader. So we need to think about flexible alternatives. So when I move up and left in TalkBack in Android, that means something to me and that gives me functionality. So even though you create a custom gesture like that in your, in your app or in your page, you need to consider that maybe that's not the only way that we should be able to instantiate that action. Maybe we need some other method or a backup mechanism to do that. We need to think about all of these different things. Um, we tend to put people in boxes and say, you're blind or you're not blind, right? You have a disability or you don't. But that is not reality. We, we have a scenario, and this is a very standard uh, Gaussian binomial bell curve distribution, whatever you want to call it. And we have people that, that live at, at one end of the extreme or another. And this one's talking about, about people's size, but think of it in terms of any ability. So you have people on one end that have maybe completely normal vision, on the other end people that have no vision, and then you have people everywhere in between. This is not a, a, a binary all or nothing scenario. We need to, to think about that all the time. Uh, today's assistive technology is really advanced. Uh, we've moved from a point where uh, solutions that we used to think were completely untenable uh, like ARIA. So ARIA stands for Accessible Rich Internet Applications, and it's a tool that we can use to add to our code to provide programmatic accessibility where it just didn't exist before. Screen readers for over the last five years have really advanced and really done a great job of getting ARIA support into, uh, into that technology. But we have to ask this kind of a question. What if a brand new version of a certain type of assistive technology just isn't modern. And I'll give you an example. This is uh, a suite of, of assistive technology tools. We've got voice, uh, uh, voice recognition up there. We've got tools built into browsers. NV Access is a, a, a screen reader for the Windows platform that's free. VoiceOver on the Mac. Uh, Zoom Text on Windows is a magnifier and reader combination. Now, all of the screen readers on there, they have done a pretty good job of keeping up with modern technology. But some other tools don't necessarily keep up. And so I'm not going to name any names or <laughs> single anybody out, but Dragon Naturally Speaking is a great tool, but it doesn't keep up with the standards. They haven't implemented any support for ARIA. And that's something that, that all the screen readers have done. Uh, this is, this is a, I'll give you an example of why that's actually important. This is a, a very 
very new version of a Google map. And these things on the interface, the, the search button and the, the, uh, the zoom in and the zoom out, those things all, all used to be divs with on-click handlers, right? Pretty straightforward practice, uh, very typical. This is something where we could actually improve that by giving it a div with a role. Instead of just having a div with an on-click, we could actually give that a role of button so that a screen reader or other piece of assistive technology, in theory, could recognize that that's a button so that there's a more uh, natural affordance there that, hey, I can actually click on this instead of it just being a div in the page. The beautiful thing about this is that, and I just literally saw this with this new revision of Google Maps, they're actually now buttons, like actual buttons. Holy crap, they're actually <laughs> buttons. And that totally gets a gold star because all the semantics of a button are already in that native element, right? This button could be used by Dragon Naturally Speaking. The div with the role of button can't be, right? So there's a question about whose responsibility is this? There's, there's a lot of, of um, people that are pointing the finger at Dragon and saying, you guys are wrong. Um, and I want you to think about this. From an ARIA perspective, this is the last time I stayed in London, I ha had this in my hotel room. This was a king size bed. And, <laughs> So I, I had a sleep apparatus with the roll of king size bed, but it was two twins with a break in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> now, I complained. I'm Canadian. I don't complain. So this was a big deal to me. Um, so I complained, and I got a new room, and I got a new bed. And so in that bed, I had a sleep apparatus, and it was a king with a class of posh. Thought everything was great until I dug a little further. <laughs> And I had a sleep apparatus with a roll of king size bed, two twins with a break, but the break was styled to be display none. <laughs> if, if you remember nothing else about ARIA, remember that what's under the sheets actually matters, right? The tools and the code that you use actually have a huge impact on how assistive technology can, can interpret it and work with it, right? So thinking about those kinds of things and thinking about, about Dragon and how it works. Uh, is, it, is it our job to be responsible, even though we have a tool like ARIA uh, that could really you know, change your app, do we have a responsibility to make some better choices and actually use things like, like real buttons or, or just better code in general? My vote is yes, um, but you know, you'll find that out in, in the next uh, little while. The other, the other thing that, that people are asking um, quite a lot about these days is stuff about detecting assistive technology. And, and I want to know, and as a developer, you probably want to know, I've heard it all morning. I'd really like to know, is this HTTP 1? Is it HTTP 2? Is it whatever? Um, do we have the capability to know? And my question to you is, if you, had, uh, if you could detect a screen reader, what would you even do with that information? And there's some real... Uh, slippery slopes that we go down when we do that kind of stuff and say, you know, and I'll give you one example and then I'll, I'll, I'll shut up. Um, you know, if, if we use a screen reader, if we detect a screen reader, we might inject a whole bunch of extra hidden headings that give some extra context to a screen reader user, which is kind of a neat idea. I think there's some, some merit to that. But we have to remember that the only people that use, a, people that use screen readers aren't just blind. Right? There's all kinds of people that use screen readers for literacy reasons. And what's the impact on them if they have a learning difficulty, if you're having a screen reader read hidden headings that they can't see on the page? Right? So we need to think bigger. Um, we'll address a lot of those kinds of questions and more during the, uh, during the panel. Thank you. Splendid. Uh, so we're back to bed components instead of web components. Not bad. So um, we have a lot of experts here. We have seven questions that we cut down on. Um, I'm supposed to get these questions on some list here, but that's not showing up at the moment. What's going on there? So, oh. Yeah, it's a tablet. Look at that. Wonderful. Touch interface, and really small and not resizable. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so the first question that we have was supposed by Andrew Betts, but he doesn't want to do it. So Melanie Lang. So um, it is, what are the main offenders of modern websites in terms of accessibility? OK, 
What are the main offenders of modern websites in terms of accessibility, and what can we and what can be done to fix that? So the question is like in many in many cases as web developers, we do things that look beautiful, and it's a barrier for accessibility without us even knowing it. So um, um, I think we're going to send that off to Matthew. So Matthew, what have you seen in your day-to-day -day browsing that drives you nuts, although people think it's amazing? Um, there's a, a, a few things. I'm sure that there's going to be many examples from the rest of the panel. But uh, I suppose a personal bugbear for me is disabling pinch to zoom on mobile sites, because that just renders them completely useless to me personally. Um, I'm vision impaired. I can see well enough to use the device, but only if I've got control over the size of things on it. Um, so that's, that's a personal one. Um, I think something to bear in mind is that um, somebody that's using an assistive technology to, to browse a website, say, for example, a screen reader, but it isn't limited to just a screen reader, they can only perceive one element at a time. So they go through the whole thing, one element by the next element, until they get to the end. And a lot of stuff in accessibility is providing information such that the assistive technology can, can help the user get to the bit of the page they want to get to as quickly as possible. So a lot of stuff is about saving the user time um, and making sure that the structure of a page is conveyed, the semantics are conveyed, so that the user saves time and can get to the bit they need. So things like lack of skip links, lack of headings, visually you can see the layout beautifully, but there's just no semantic information or no structural information there. Um, that's very frustrating because it might actually be with a, a trend on modern sites is towards things like simpler language, fewer words on the page, more focused. You know, it, it could be really good, but sometimes people forget the basics, which is just make sure that you use HTML headings and lists and stuff like that, ARIA, if necessary. Uh, if necessary, excuse me, and native controls where possible. Um, so things that save people time. Um, and there was also an article I read recently about um, things that just have to go away. Um, things like when you're asked to enter a credit card number and you're asked what type of credit card is it, and please remember to put the dashes in, or don't put dashes in, or put spaces in, or you know, telling the user to do this stuff, OK, for all of us, that's really annoying. It, it shouldn't be necessary. It's just a number. Um, but for accessibility, uh, people facing extra accessibility barriers, that sort of stuff, having to go back and correct it because the instructions weren't necessarily there um, or correct, that can really take a lot of time. And it's very frustrating. So it's going back to, to like using sensible HTML, building things the way they used to work. I remember when browsers were bad, you had to use the right HTML, or otherwise they wouldn't show up, because there was no CSS. So <laughs> to a degree, we then used tables for different weird things, but that's a different story. So um, Alice, the, the, the shockingly innovative way of using buttons instead of divs with on-click handlers, do you have to fight for these kind of things? Is there, is there a way that developers are actually assuming that things work in the browser because the browser fixes it for them? And do we have to remind people how to make things accessible? Um, well, if you're, yeah, if you're using standard, standard widgets, by and large, it should be accessible. One of the big problems we see is that people just simply aren't using the standard widgets. And yeah, I would, I would very much like to understand why my hypothesis is that you can't style them the way you want. So uh, two, two problems. One, you can't style them the way you want, or they don't behave the way you want. So one thing I would like to see is making it easier to style custom elements the way that we want to. It's quite difficult today. It's a very simple problem to solve, I think. Um, secondly, make it easier for developers to actually apply that ARIA metadata, semantic information. How can we get that on our the golden path that we've been talking about today, or the, the pit of success? How can we make that easier for developers? Um, I think that Web Components possibly has a big role to play here. Um, and I know that the team is working on that. Another idea would be to put it into the developer tools that we're all using. So how can we expose the accessibility information such that it's impossible to ignore? Would so it, wouldn't it be better to make it harder to put ARIA on stuff? How do you mean? Well, ARIA is a great solution for screen readers, but it's not right now for Dragon. And I know in good conscience that, that I, I won't, we don't use ARIA unless we know that it's going to get really good support and that we look for other ways to do things when we're building things. I almost would like to make it better to just use a button 
you know, than to add role equals button I on completely, something. Yeah, I completely we're, agree. We're coming back to Aria in an extra question later on, and I, yeah, I agree. It's it's a it's a tricky thing to actually uh, to actually turn something into something that it isn't when there is something that is already something. But that's a different story. Um, so, uh, Andrew, uh, what do you see uh, as like? crimes that are happening that actually make things inaccessible on mobile devices when you, people use HTML. I found it interesting, for example, that the unsightly select box that people <coughs> hated on the desktop and always wanted to style is awesome on, on mobile devices. Yeah, um, I think on mobile, um, I think Matthew's already covered it, the biggest one is disabling pinch to zoom. Um, you know, I've had so many users come to me with that, with that problem. I'm asking, you know, why does my pinch to zoom not work on this website? And it comes down to the way we're using the meta viewport tag. And we're all using it to kind of get rid of the 300 millisecond delay, which um, I guess in the past, my advice would be to developers, you know, think about how you use that. But I guess now going forward, I'm thinking, you know, should people like myself be getting more involved with browser vendors to say, OK, developers are doing this. Is there a way that we can kind of cater for both scenarios rather than say to developers, don't do that? Is there a way that we can kind of, you know, get this fixed through bugs with the browsers, basically? So that's probably the biggest one. Um, I think on desktop, the the best bit of advice I could give to you guys would be try using the things you build with a keyboard only. Um, so just recently, I was working with someone who's having a, a huge problem with their online banking, where they couldn't complete um, a, tr a payment to somebody um, because it was using an overlay. And whoever had built that had clearly thought about the interaction with the mouse. You know, things behind the overlay were disabled. You couldn't click on them. But because this user was using the keyboard, their interaction was going wildly wrong. Um, and if the developer had thought, you know, OK, maybe what if someone's not using a the mouse, they probably would have come up, uh, found that problem quite quickly and, you know, could have done something about it. Cool. I'm very excited that Jake Archibald has a question, but we have to move on to the next topic. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Ross Green has a question for us. You're not Ross Green. I'm not Ross Green, but Ross Green uh, is not attending, so has asked me to ask the question. And I'm also going to answer it, because I've got a microphone. Accessibility <laughs> expectations and requirements are vastly different depending on the user's world region. What more could be done to align them? Example, most EU, rule, EU rules say don't autoplay media. However, most US media will autoplay. The answer is don't autoplay media. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and a slight snark is, well, EU rules could be more widely promulgated if the EU government websites actually obeyed their own rules. <laughs> okay. The but good anyway, thing the what could be done to align the different territories' regulations about accessibility? So the good news is that this was hard to understand. Um, the question is basically, uh, there's twofold to that. There's differences between accessibility guidelines in Europe and in America. And you have to, for example, when you do government websites, when you do very much basic, f any website that faces a lot of audience, mm -hmm. you have to apply, uh, apply with them. Uh, you have to basically apply the rules and are different from Europe to America. As this World Wide Web of us is worldwide kind of confusing to which ones to follow. So are there ways to actually get the legal requirements um, more aligned with each other. So um, maybe Sarah, you could do some, tell us something about that. Um, the thing I find interesting about this question is it refers to geography, which I think is really important. Um, obviously, we know devices vary, our tools <coughs> vary, and so forth. But also, it's worth understanding and thinking about how disability varies um, globally and internationally. So um, we've already heard a little bit about, say, the nature of disability and how we might want to conceptualize it. But it's worth also, I think, recognizing that disability means different things in different parts of the world. Uh, and levels and types of disability vary depending on where you are um, by locale, region, um, as well as by, by nation. So personally, I think there's a bit of a tension in terms of picking um, a standard to apply in all situations. I think there, I mean, the great thing about WCAG is that it's a guideline. And when it's applied as a guideline, it allows perhaps for more of that um, indigenous reflection, um, the expertise of local developers to, to come into play as well. So they can account maybe for um, an indigenous population with lower literacy levels or perhaps who have 
uh, less assistive technologies. Um, at the moment, there's not a great deal of data globally in terms of um, the kinds of technologies that disabled peoples are using. Um, but obviously, WCAG in particular is being picked up because the uh, UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities is um, being taken up by more and more countries. And people have this kind of policy vacuum in terms of information and communication tech, uh, technologies that are referred to in the UN Convention. And people want to uh, make sure their sort of policy is picking that up. So WCAG is being applied more and more as the kind of verbatim standard but I think, there's, I think there is a, a, a bit of a tension in terms of you know, knowing what that means, say, in Nepal or Uganda or you know, uh, more regionally. It is kind of confusing because, I mean, being a, a, an ex-German developer and now living here, there's different guidelines even in Europe from country to country. So uh, maybe in point of the RNIB, you, I guess you work with a lot of people that come to you and say, like, I don't want to be sued. What can I do for people with disabilities? Which is the awful, awful question we keep getting. Yeah. What, what is your answer to that? Like, how do you get people to understand that just applying with the law does not necessarily make an accessible interface? Um, so I think there is, a, there is a, for me, there is a business case behind accessibility, which we'll often talk to companies about around, you know, some potential SEO benefits, potentially opening it up to new markets. And I think when I first got into that sector, or this sector, sorry, um, you know, I kind of, I really did believe in that business case. And I still do. Um, but at the same time, it's a little bit theoretical because we don't have many case studies to back it up. So um, Derek's point about what if we could detect a screen reader. Um, I think I'm with you, Derek. I don't think it's a good idea to detect a screen reader if you're going to do something with that information in terms of the website. But I'd really like that feature as part of analytics so that you know we can say, OK, we, we made some changes to the website and we can now see perhaps you know, screen readers are not dropping out midway through, um, you know, the process of checking out or something like that. So um, I'd really like that kind of stuff because we don't have many good case studies. So whilst we can say, yeah, maybe you can get more visitors, we don't have any figures really to back that up. Yeah. Uh, Derek, you used to work on that for a long time as well, like back in Watts days and things with like, I mean, we had guidelines that said you have to have a certain kind of access key on the page, yeah. for example, and that was not enforceable or usable, really. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of things in, you know, you have to remember that, especially when you talk about guidelines, accessibility guidelines, and then talk about giving them the force of legislation. You're cr taking something that is designed to be necessarily fuzzy and putting it into something that becomes absolute black and white. And, and I would even respond to Bruce and say, you know, we all said, you know, everybody laughed. He said, well, the simple answer is do not autoplay. And I would counter that by saying that autoplay can actually be useful for certain types of people, including people that have mobility difficulties. It may be actually much easier for them if you do autoplay so that when you go to a new video page, it actually does play for them. They don't have to try and work hard to actually get it to play. So when we're putting you know, embedding a YouTube video or a whatever video on a site of ours, we always recommend have it embedded and don't autoplay that one, but also link to the YouTube page outside because then the user has the preference to set it up so that my videos on YouTube always autoplay. So we're kind of catering for both, both things there. So the, you know, the edicts like do not autoplay, they sound really good, but they don't necessarily always make sense. Autoplay is, is bad for everyone except for the people that need it. Okay, we have a question from Christopher Imri. I just wanted to kind of chime <coughs> in, uh, just with regards to Diane about like differences between EU law and you know, US law. Uh, so yeah, so the difference between the EU and US law, I just wanted to kind of, just with regards to my experience, I found that it's actually even more complicated because the requirements of accessibility don't just live in the government legislature, like for example, when you get to a client who reaches the level where they're now rolling out in different markets, they will then have their own accessibility requirements layer within that, which typically will be based off one market, even though they're rolling out locally. I mean, that's my own experience, even though they're rolling out globally. So we've actually encountered situations whereby we're using like the, in one example, like the EU accessibility guidelines, even though we're rolling out in you know, the UAE or in China and things like that. Um, and that becomes a very, weird, strained situation because the document a lot of times that the accessibility was kind of created at the company's end was tick off a box to say, well, yes, we have accessibility guidelines, but they didn't roll it out to the market level. Um, so I just wanted to say it's, it's 
you know, on top of the, the government legislature, there's the actual corporate layer as well. It's a super tricky uh, uh, all in all problem. And the issue is a lot of people try to sell as accessibility as something you could be sued if you don't do it right. But then we don't have the answer how to do it right. It's like getting someone's attention by kicking them in the shins. Like, yeah, you have their attention, but not their support. <laughs> so <laughs> Shane Hudson has a question for us on this, not uh, kicking, but general. <laughs> He's there, the man in the striped shirt. Um, so are the um, WorkAG <laughs> guidelines redundant in a world of smartphones and tablets? Are accessibility laws trying to fix now place as well? It's kind of yeah, kind of. So basically the question is the WCAG guidelines define a lot of stuff, for example, keyboard accessibility, which is on a touch device a bit of a weird thing to enforce. So um, need, do they need to be upgraded? Do we need to think about different form factors? Um, I think the best would be uh, just, uh, Sarah, what do you think? Um, I think it's a, this is a problem with the nature of standards. In, in there's quite a lot of interesting writing about what standards do sort of outside of um, development communities. Um, so, so for example, they, they offer a fixed perspective, um, which is, what I think some of us are struggling with in the sense that disability is so heterogenic that it needs to sort of it be as inclusive as possible and, and a standard rather than a guideline <coughs> is difficult. Um, so, so I think, yeah, there are these, these problems about how it keeps abreast of new developments which we can't necessarily foresee. <coughs> but I think one of the things which I find interesting is that um, standards also convey certain values and, as I say, when they're being picked up internationally, there's, um, uh, it, it's useful to recognise that they also promote the rights of people with disabilities and they promote their access to technology and raise a kind of whole um, argument about um, human rights, <coughs> disability rights, which isn't necessarily reflected in all the communities that these standards touch upon. So that's, that's one of the things I think which we need to also keep front and centre. Hmm. Matthew, uh, in terms of gaming, I mean, the Pacciello Group does a great job in explaining on their blog what, how to apply WCAG guidelines, how to apply best technologies, and most people start with a blank canvas with no keyboard accessibility whatsoever for their game. So uh, do you think that the WCAG is outdated? Do, are we fixing the web from 1997 rather than the web from 2005? Um, a couple of things. First of all, the, the gaming stuff is, is separate to my TPG stuff, but I'm very happy to talk about it, of course. Um, you don't get fired. Sarah don't made a really good point um, last night, which um, uh, I just wanted to make sure came up, which is that a screen reader could be a person next to you reading what's on the screen in a, in a particular place. You were saying about different countries have different social views of accessibility and different access to ATs, and, and therefore um, screen reader det detection would have to <coughs> encompass reading glasses and people sat next to you as well, um, and both of these at the same time, perhaps. Anyway, um, moving on to answering the actual question. Um, <laughs> a, a couple of points. One of them is that um, the, if, if you look at WCAG, and there's a lot to read, but the central points that it's trying to get across and the values that, that Sarah mentioned, they're actually written down in there. They are uh, the poor principles that your content needs to be perceivable operable, uh, understandable, and robust. And you can look up what those are, but the, you get the general idea. You can apply those kind of principles to any medium. Um, now, some of the WCAG stuff might be less appropriate on mobile, some of the very specific technical stuff, but a lot of the guidelines, in fact, well, all of them are, are written with that, those uh, four principles in mind, and you can apply those to any um, medium. So in terms of game uh, accessibility, that is about making sure that you know what information is important to someone to be able to play this game, um, what is the best way to present it to the, the particular audience that you're uh, thinking about. In our case, it was blind people, so it was making a lot of visual cues auditory instead. Um, understandable, um, that well, uh, it's got to be understandable to be able to be enjoyable in the case of a game and in the case of a banking website it's got to be understandable in order to be able to use it and robust 
uh, that covers the kind of security and reliability stuff on the website side of things. And on the game side of things, you don't want it to crash just before you're going to complete the level. So uh, very briefly, that is you know, a very glib, high level trying to demonstrate you can apply these things to multiple areas. So Alice, when you put that into the developer tools accessibility panel, I mean, uh, those of us who have been in accessibility long enough remember Bobby approved and people put in like triple A badges on their website, which ironically didn't have an alternative text. Um, <laughs> What are the testing tools that you, that you have in there? Do you get like, this doesn't apply with that guideline, or is it more of a transcription of the perceivable and um, the, the ideas of it? Because it's easy for a developer to say, like, oh, I'm now accessible because I tick all the boxes, mm -hmm. but what does it really mean? What kind of a test tool would help people there? So one, one point that I always try to make with the accessibility developer tools is that passing a mechanical accessibility audit does not in any way guarantee that you're completely accessible. It's only looking at the things that we can test programmatically, which is a subset. Um, that said, what it does look at are things like color contrast. It, look, it tries to look for click targets and suggest that you should use an ARIA role and a, a keyboard handling. Um, it also looks for valid ARIA use. Uh, it, yeah, so those are, those are sort of the main things that it's looking at. Um, yeah, so but one, one point I did want to make just to, to follow on uh, it's that the, the robust in perceivable, operable, understandable, robust actually encapsulates working in different modalities, which actually implies that it should work on different devices. So when we're talking about mobile, tablet, even something like Google Glass or a TV or a Leap, robust encapsulates all of that. Good. Um, Matthew, do you have a question or are you pulling it? She covered everything you do. I just wanted to show that somebody from Google has something to say about accessible. No, I was yeah. going to ask, like, is there any, since you're all there, um, <laughs> <laughs> so as I, I have you so here. I, I once made a, a, um, a comment about changing an outline in CSS and basically changing the background color for the focus. I got slated immediately on Twitter for this. It's not accessible. And I'm fine with that. And I'm kind of like, well, what, what is the right way to do it? And there's a part of me that's like, well, can I apply filters to my site that says, this is what a screen reader will see? Or, like, what should I be doing in my workflow that basically helps me as a developer make my site more accessible, I guess? Are there tools? Is there some things you'd recommend? Or is it just a case of use native components, use the accessibility thing, and use that? So, Derek? using, and, and I'll, you know, 75% of all statistics are made up. So, <laughs> You can get probably two nine. Out, two no, out of seven people know that. Yeah, <laughs> you can you can get you know 85, 80 to ninety percent of the way accessible by testing everything with a keyboard, and and you have to manually test that because that's interaction. There's no way to test it other than that. Um, but dealing with like straight up good solid semantic markup, that using just writing good HTML and not screwing up keyboard access gets you 80 to 90% of the way there. Straight up, honest, honest truth. Now, the, using it with the keyboard is going to show you stuff about your outline changes, right? You're going to go through and you're going to say, shit, I can't see the cursor. I have no idea where I am. So I have to stop this cursing uh, right now, actually. And uh, we, we, this is a longer topic that we could go on. So um, I'm moving on to actually Ed Soden, which uh, is actually covering this a bit. So Ed Soden has a question. Oh, I'm reading this one. Yeah. Mr. Snowden, uh, Soden. <laughs> was I not allowed to say? <laughs> um, so as developers, we often try and make our sites work well for screen readers. But is there anything else we can do besides screen readers uh, when we're designing our sites to make them better for accessibility? That is an incredibly interesting question that we haven't quite covered yet, or just did, or tried. Uh, so Andrew, what do you think? the big screen reader debate. Every developer I talk to, like, it works with a screen reader because that's something I can test with. What else should we be thinking about? Um, no, it's a great question. And I could make up some stats now, but I'm not going to. Go ahead. Um, in the UK, there's some around 2 million people uh, that have some kind of sight-related uh, issue. And the vast majority of those have some residual useful vision. So the thing you can take away from that is Quite a small percentage of those two million people are using a screen reader. The rest of them are making some kind of visual adaptations to the page. Uh, and I think you can extrapolate that to around the world issues. So I think around the world, it's something like 280 million people have some site-related issue. 
So things that you can do that are not related to a screen reader. Um, and this it kind of applies to all of us. You think about using a, a website out and about, uh, color contrast, the size of your font, uh, how much white space is between controls. So someone who's using a screen magnifier, um, I'll see sites sometimes where there's a form and maybe there's two buttons at the end, next and previous. They're really far apart from each other. Um, if someone's using a screen magnifier, I think Matt kind of touched on this before. It's a little bit different with a screen magnifier, but you see a portion of the screen at any one time. Um, those of you that everyone pretty much has Macs here, you'll all have a screen magnifier built in, uh, Windows as well. So you, you can try this out if you want. Another way to think about it is if you imagine like sliding a credit card around your screen, <laughs> just imagine that was your viewport. So if the buttons are far apart, you know, it, there's potential to miss them. So just that, that kind of stuff is worth thinking about, and that's nothing to do with screen readers at all. Yeah, and uh, uh, that's a very good point. I love the credit card thing. I didn't think about that yet. My favorite is always when people, now everything comes with screen readers, which is great for accessibility for people, but it also is kind of bad because developers think they know how these things work now. The amount of people I see using a screen reader with their eyes open is amazing. <laughs> and that defeats the purpose, because of course you can understand your system. So James Abley has a question, or was that already about the last topic? Yeah, that was about the last topic. Okay, good. So um, do you have another one? They put Vaseline on glasses and put gloves on to simulate athrosis. Yeah. yeah. So, so maybe do we need to go back and just do that? Maybe and go this extra mile? So testing testing this kind of way works. I mean, I gave people yeah. broken mice to actually use the website, for example, with. Yeah, there's there's tons of things that you can do like that to, you know, to simulate different types of disability, and and I, I believe that all of those things are great. You know, user, you know, emulating what a, a user with a particular type of disability would be. You can, you want to see what it's like for somebody that has a, a tremor in their hand to use their use a mouse, turn your mouse sideways <laughs> and try to manipulate it on the screen, and you'll you'll, you know, or use the wrong hand. There's all kinds of things that you can do. The the one thing that I would point out, and I think those are those are great things to do. The WCAG guidelines are designed specifically because we know. And I say we like I was involved or something, but we can't all go and test with real people. And so those guidelines are all in place because they're based on years and years of people actually working with with uh, with people with disabilities. So that those are if you like absolutely valuable and useful, and everybody should do it. But if you can't do that, then you have guidelines as your as your sort of first point of advice. And I absolutely go back to it, but. If you can't, just feel at least partially confident that those those guidelines are there to replace the fact that everybody can't do that. But actually, um, oh, um, I feel <coughs> I, I completely understand where you're coming from, but I also feel that's a bit of a cop out in terms of um, I think I think sometimes standards step in and people want to learn the standard because that's the easy thing to do and they want to turn their mouse sideways and do that when sometimes they have disabled populations sitting right under their nose. So, for example, in the university sector, there are hundreds of disabled students at King's College London. How many are involved in testing our systems? You know, they're right there. We could easily engage with them. So I, I think there is an, it's important to be creative and, and think about you know, people drawing people into this conversation. So if you're doing usability testing at large, don't be afraid of you know, contacting, say, disabled people's organisations or putting a call out for, for people to get involved in testing your systems because they will give you much richer feedback about how your, your interfaces work and they're going to bring up things that you just would not have imagined possible. It would be interesting to see if uh, what kind of, I mean, you can take the glasses away from your colleagues, for example, or you can read out your text on the screen to somebody on the phone. If it, done, if it then makes sense, you know it's an accessible text. If, it's, if you need the thing to see to understand it then, it, then you don't. Like, there's a lot of, it would be interesting to set up a wiki or something about these, like, little accessibility hacks to simulate different things, but outreach to real people with real disabilities, hardcore users that know how to use something, is amazing. I mean, I learned most working next to a PHP developer who was blind for like four years, and that was just incredible because he coded faster than me, which is annoying. <laughs> now, uh, with a sense of dread, Patrick Lauke has a question. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, 
No, I haven't got a question. I've got a lengthy statement. No. Just a, just a quick <laughs> note. I, I wanted to pick up just on something that uh, was mentioned at the start there about I did something to my outline and I was immediately jumped upon by you know an accessibility lynch mob. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the dirty kind of truth, uh, even within the Pacello group, I can I can say that hopefully openly, is that uh, you get three accessibility experts, you get five different opinions. We disagree even on sometimes very fundamental things, like you know very first guideline of Bookag, you know if you know having appropriate old text, we could have discussions for days about what is the most appropriate old text for this, and you'll get fierce debates in the accessibility community about. Every image should have this kind of old, or no image should have old. And so, just wanted to kind of temper the, the whole when you get people jumping on you and, and immediately shouting, Oh, that's not accessible. They may be right, or they may not be right. And as, as Derek mentioned towards the start, is that it is not a binary thing. It's not always, it's either accessible or inaccessible. There's certainly things that you can do that completely screw everybody over that can't see the screen perfectly and use a mouse. But beyond that, that's the, there's lots of shades of gray on that one. Yeah, also n stop arguing on Twitter. 140 characters are not good to actually bring emotions or facts in. <laughs> um, <laughs> we've got Nikhil Verma here, because Christopher has said too many things already. <laughs> So basically, I did a bit of a stat check, and I checked that there are about 2.7 million people in Britain uh, who have color blindness. Um, and haven't seen that mentioned in this talk yet. Uh, do we consider people who are colorblind to be disabled, or are there any things that people generally can do to improve their pages to prove that they look for colorblind? I met, a few, stable? I met a few unstable colorblind people in my past. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I, think uh, I think your tools, uh, um, Alice, uh, yeah. I mean, you said you talked about like uh, the, the color distance, but also <laughs> colorblindness is one of the simulators in there, isn't it? No, not in, not in my tool, actually. Um, well, that can be fixed. There are <laughs> <laughs> sure, you want to send me a patch? <laughs> um, there, are, there are extensions, for certainly for Chrome, probably for other browsers as well, which will simulate color blindness. Um, and contrast ratio is also in a, has a color blindness implication in that, you know, say if you have like red on white, um, if you view that as gray, it may not be high enough contrast ratio. Um, Derek, you were twitching? Well, a little. Um, the, there's a great tool, Color Oracle, yeah. um, which you can install at the desktop level, and it will transform everything. And you can you can simulate things. It doesn't, you know, the two challenges with color blindness, and I'm saying this is a very blanket statement. So there's probably more challenges, but one is the color contrast issue. The other is the way that you're using color to convey information, right? If you're relying on color, then you need to. It's not. We're not saying don't rely on color. Use color as much as you want, but use other mechanisms to indicate things as well. So it could be, you know, it could be that you're using pattern with color, or instead of just using color, think of a, a line graph that has a, a legend at the bottom. Instead of putting the legend at the bottom, change your graph so that each one of the individual legend pieces is actually up beside the line, so that you can then follow the line. Um, this also ties into a, into internationalization. My favorite is when people just use red as a warning, whereas in China it means good luck. Good luck, we lost all your emails. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh God, lots of questions. So, um, let's have one here. The man in the loud shirt. <laughs> bad. Sorry about my shirt. Uh, <laughs> I was just thinking, we've talked a lot today about um, web performance and things like that, and about how does the whole performance piece fit into accessibility? Obviously, one kind of coming to mind is things being too fast, where we're, where we're constantly working to speed things up. You know, is there cases in accessibility where we actually need to slow it down? Mm. So, you know, th there was a few of, I had a few thoughts when listening to all the other performance things, and one of the things that I heard was, you know, what's in the first 15, 15 kilobytes? And I, I started to think, you know, what, what should be in the first 15 kilobytes for somebody that has a particular type of disability? And, and I don't know the answer to that question. I think it's, it's a, a great one. Um, I'm not sure about slowing things down. Um, you know, most technology, you know, most screen reading technology and other technologies, they work on top of browsers. They're not their own thing, generally speaking. So uh, I'm thinking I'm, where I'm kind of coming from is about the thought of perception 
if something changes on the screen too quickly, and it becomes harder for visually impaired people to actually detect that change. You know. Are you, so are you talking about in response to some event that's happened on the page, or like an initial load, or? Um, These are more like UX problems, isn't it? I, I think like drop down menu. Yeah. Yeah, something, yeah, just some, just 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 a case of stuff changing, either naturally in a carousel, which is kind of automated, or in response to an action. Yeah. yeah so on on a carousel, for example, we always you have to have if it auto plays, you have to be able to turn it off, and you have to be able to start it up again. Um, so I'm not sure that that's really slowing it down from a performance perspective, but you should definitely allow for somebody to manually go through the carousel. Um, if you have to have one on your on your page, um, we also do things like if if you know the carousel container, when you detect keyboard usage within that container, we automatically stop uh, stop it from rotating so that it immediately becomes uh, a manual thing if you're moving through it with the keyboard, so that you you basically take a, you know a screen reader that's on that on that content. If it's suddenly whisked away, quite often what happens that you know if the node is just slidden slidden nice word. If the, the node slides out uh, out to the side, uh, that's different than if the node is destroyed. Uh, and in some of these cases, the screen reader focus is lost, and they have to start at the start over at the top of the page. So that's that's something where we want to kind of give them a little bit more control. I think we are running the danger here and getting into implementations and explaining you how to do a certain widget. And uh, we are all open to discussion for that. It would be wonderful to ask, get a few questions sorted, and then we can answer offline. Because right here now, it would be like, do it like this or do it like that. So sort of to answer the broader question about timing, there there is language in WCAG about how how long things should take, how much time you should allow for things. So that maybe gets a bit more at your question. And also, like, to me, raises a bit of a broader question, which is I'm curious how many web developers have even looked at WCAG 2? Quite a, quite a few. Cool. Um, this, like, to me, it seems like this, it, it's a great set of guidelines for creating good user interfaces. So for example, things like allowing um, error correction in forms. Like, do we not all want that? Do we not all want the form to lose all of our data if we make a single mistake? Um, so yeah, I think the web would be better for everybody if we all followed WCAG, and this is this is an example of something which is in there, which we like could learn about just from reading the guidelines. And of course, there's more, there's stuff that's not in there, or there's stuff that that needs more information, but it's a really great place to start. Okay, uh, we're skip uh, we're running out of time here a bit, so we're skipping one of the questions that I've seeded. Sadly enough, uh, we have one from Aurelia Moser here. Um, uh, I skipped Dan Applequist, he can deal with it. Okay. Um, so I'm wondering, how do you prioritize accessibility in your workflow? And uh, right now it seems that reactive is something you need to do, so how can we make it just the thing to do? It's the old question of like, where's the accessibility plugin that I can put at the end of my workflow? How do you, how do you get accessibility into the workflow from the very beginning in a cutthroat environment that has not much time? Derek. It's got to be moved earlier in the process. If it gets to if it gets to the end and you're finding accessibility issues for the first time in QA or as you're preparing it for QA, it's too late. It has to be done at the design level. And I think if you focus very loosely on, you know, design, development, and QA as as kind of three important pieces, not thinking about the business side, that's important, but the the focusing on the transition points, I think, is is critical. So having designers talk with developers and specking things out. Not like as in the spec, but here's what my intent is with this design. And so that, that a design can specify things like here's how the keyboard flow should work uh, for this particular widget or for this page. Here's the, the most, you know, even working on it together. Here's the most logical source order. Uh, you know, looking at this wireframe and the hierarchy of content, here's the most logical source order for that. And having that stuff passed all the way down the chain uh, is, to me, is one of the most critical things that that would help address that so that it happens earlier and and we don't get to the end and say Andrew what do you think um, this is someone else's point of view I can't remember whose article it was but um, we was talking about how the first time you do something it is difficult and it takes you longer to do it so if you guys can remember the first time you built a website it was probably hard and it took you a long time the first time you built a responsive site it would have been 
you know, your mind might have been a bit blown, like this is taking me a long time, but then the next time you do it, it's easier. The next time you do it again, it's easier, and then it just becomes normal. And uh, it's kind of like that with accessibility. It only seems hard because it's not something you'll do day to day. But if you kind of, if you do invest a bit of time and effort into doing it a couple of times, your workflow will change, and it, it just will become something you do naturally. Um, I can't remember whose opinion that was, but I really liked it when I read it. If I, I completely can, agree with that, um, and I completely agree with various things that have been said before, like, for example, just try it out with a keyboard as you're doing it. I mean, the most important thing is, as Derek pointed out, to do it from the very start, from the design process, but you're all going to be dealing with stuff that already exists. And the, there is some things, um, uh, I think Alice mentioned accessibility testing, you can't do it all mechanically, but some of it you can. And... Um, Perhaps this is going to sound odd coming from me because I'm very much reliant on uh, me going to look at uh, a site and finding accessibility problems with it. But there are a whole range of things that you can test me mechanically. Uh, for example, does every image have an alt attribute? It's a very simple <coughs> thing. Now, one of my uh, colleagues is working on or has developed a, a tool, an API, in fact. Um, it's going to be in beta soon. Uh, it's called Tenon. Um, which can perform these tests that, are, that can be automated, and it will go away and perform them. And because it's a command line thing, you can make it part of your build process. So if there were two biggest things I would say is perhaps look at that, see what it can do for you, because it can be part of your build process. A human being does not need to waste their time on some of this stuff. And the other thing is make sure that you can you know, challenge yourself to, like Christian said, uh, take away the mouse for a while and see if you can still use your site. Um, some stuff like that, you can really reduce the amount of time and effort it takes by making it part of your process. And as much as possible, please do try and consider it from the design stage, from the, from the absolute get-go. Um, and then there's the other sorts of advice that, that you've heard just generally sprinkled through about testing things with a keyboard and, and stuff like that. I'd like to just interject a little bit of sociology because I know um, part of the issue is that it has to be a team effort across your entire team. Some people are going to value accessibility more than others and I think it's trying to position accessibility as part of a norm which is understanding that disabled people aren't an out group, they're part of your in group. So at the moment um, there's a, a term aversive disabilism. So most people believe they're quite liberal, they don't discriminate against disabled people. But if you're designing for your group, and that group doesn't include disabled people, then you might as well be making disabledist judgments, because you're still excluding. The outputs are still the same. So in that sense, it's, it's important to sort of expand our concept of who a normal user is to include disabled people, um, you know, of, of, of who we know. OK, we have to wrap up. So I, I have to thank the panel. And I, I'm incredibly excited about all of your interests, because having worked in accessibility and having to shout at people for years to consider accessibility, it's great that there is a new way there. It's kind of disheartening that we have to remind people about something. There seems to be a communication gap between the accessibility evangelists and the developers out there. And a lot of things can be repeated that have been said a few times. So I'm really happy about this. So take this idea, take this enthusiasm about it out there and pester as many people as possible who know about accessibility. And if you get grumpy answers, as Patrick said, we're just people too. So um, that just happens. So thanks very much again and thank you.